thanks for the opportunity to present here today. So uh, I'm going to tell you about our dream that uh, we've been working on for basically two decades, uh, is uh, creating vascularized myocardium. And the way we imagine this is to have a tissue that can span many uses, going from in vivo implantation all the way to studies of dysfunction and finally uh, drug testing. And uh, the first thing that we did uh, about 10 years ago is we realized that topographical cues are very important in vitro. And uh, we had a very, very simple uh, system, one that included very si simple polydimethyl siloxane stamp that just had grooves and ridges. And we filled these grooves and ridges with a hydrogel that was releasing an angiogenic growth factor. And then we just took two blood vessels, explants from a human umbilical cord, or they can also be from a mouse, put them on the two different sides of this stamp. And what happened over time is that uh, the outgrowths uh, from these two uh, vessel explants connected to create a perfusible vascular bed. And then around this vascular bed, we could place cardiomyocytes to get vascularized myocardium. Uh, and this is what the blood vessels look like. Um, this is um, uh, the explants from uh, mice who were GFP positive under control of actin promoters. So you can see about three weeks you get uh, microvasculature connecting. And uh, there was definitely an impact of the topographical cues on the types of uh, branching of the vessels that you get. And we saw uh, optimum vessel length and uh, branching with about 50 micron cues. And uh, were these real uh, lumens? Were these really microvessels or just uh, cells connected in cords? So when we did various types of imaging, uh, including confocal imaging, which you can see on the uh, left, as well as TM imaging and uh, staining for endothelial markers, we saw that definitely the, these vessels have lumens. And maybe uh, somebody can click on the movie. Um, if we see the cardiomyocytes around these vessels and we perfuse them with a dye, we can see some contraction. The drawback of this approach is twofold. A, you need vessels to start from, right? And that's not always possible. Uh, if you have vascular dysfunction, uh, it's not possible to harvest healthy uh, vessels from the donor. And this vascular bed is extremely fragile. You can't really pick it up and manipulate it uh, easily. So it was fun to do the experiment, but you can't really use this vascular bed for a lot of things. So then we discovered the polymeric elastomers and about uh, 12 years ago or so, and this really transformed the things we do in the lab. There's this particular elastomer, which is called POMAC. It's a copolymer of 1,8-octandiol, malic hydride, and citric acid. It's moldable uh, according to the uh, little animation that we created that you can see uh, in the slides. And if you take this PDMS stamp and uh, you let POMAC um, flow through it or you stamp POMAC into PDMS stamp, you can build very sophisticated structures. And the first step of this is creating PDMS stamp, which happens in the clean room in the craft facility at the University of Toronto. And uh, you have so many degrees of freedom with this. You can control mechanical properties through chemistry. You can control permeability by including uh, uh, porogens such as PEG, which you can see in that TEM image. And then you can co control the shape at micro scale, uh, at the scale of 10 to 100 micrometers using uh, these PDMS stamps. And so Boyang Zhang, who is now a professor at McMaster University, when he was in my lab, said, well, look at the computer chip. It's just a very complex network at the micrometer scale, and so does angiogenesis. So what if we create something that we will call angiochip, which is just a microfluidic scaffold created uh, out of this polymeric elastomer uh, with open lumens branching in X, Y, and Z direction. So he did this in the clean room using PDMS stamps and using this new technique that he created, which is called 3D stamping, where in the, he builds this structure in layers. 
And uh, you can see in the uh, glass slides there that despite this being done manually, this technique is still scalable. You can get many at the same time. And uh, the trick is really when you're using the polymers to uh, provide enough permeability. So polymers are not permeable. You know that from experience, uh, like Ziploc bags, um, plastic mugs, all things around you that are made of plastic hold water and molecules in place and they don't let them you know, transfer to the environment. But obviously blood vessels enable communication between the endothelium and the surrounding tissue. So we had to incorporate two levels of porosity. These nanopores, which I mentioned earlier, which enable um, flow of small, basically transfer of small molecules and proteins, and then micro holes. The red arrows are pointing to micro holes, and you can see how these micro holes connect lumens to the space around them. And these micro holes enable cells to go in and out of these uh, blood vessels. Uh, also around uh, uh, the structure that is covered by lumens, you can see a lattice like a mesh. And in this mesh, we can see whatever cell type we want. By controlling the shape and size of the mesh, we can control overall apparent mechanical properties of these microfluidic scaffolds. We run all of our uh, devices based on pressure head. We rarely use pumps. So the way we provide flow to angiochip is if we put it in uh, a well plate, such as the one shown in the top right, uh, the angiochip goes in the middle chamber, and if we put more media upstream compared to downstream, we will drive flow through the lumens. And then we see cells in the gel around these blood vessels. And so we, we, we can have different configurations, 1D, 2D, 3D. Obviously 1D is just a tube, 2D is branching blood vessels in X and Y direction, and 3D is branching in X, Y, and Z direction. And now you can see a little bit better the view of those micro holes. And in the graph here, you can see that once we introduce these micro holes, it is the endothelial cells that will line these lumens that really control permeability. You can see that the permeability is very low without micro holes. It increases with micro holes, but when you coat the lumen with endothelial cells, the permeability of the vessels goes down, which tells you that they are now controlling resistance, which is what it should be. And so in this image, you can see what the, what, uh, what the endothelialization looks like once we coat all of those uh, lumens. We get very nice uh, confluent endothelium. And if we apply an angiogenic stimulus in the parenchymal space around these blood vessels, we drive migration of endothelial cells through the micro holes, which you can see there in G, which is really the first step of angiogenesis. As that happens in H, you can see how the uh, permeability goes up very significantly. And also if we uh, apply inflammatory stimuli such as TNF-alpha, and then we perfuse these blood vessels with monocytes, we can get rolling and extrusion. So this just demonstrates that uh, these networks uh, mimic some uh, functions of the real vasculature. And uh, could somebody click on the movie, please, Supplemental Movie 5? What Boeing was also able to implant these microfluidic scaffolds in animals. And you can see if you, uh, for example, uh, in, you can cut the R3 in a leg of a rat and implant uh, the uh, microvascular bed by direct anastomosis, you establish the flow, as well as also R3 to vein configuration. In one case, we had endothelialized vessels, in the other one, non-endothelialized, and we didn't get thrombosis in either of these cases, and that's due to material properties. This polymer has citric acid, which can chelate um, uh, calcium ions, and those are required for activation of platelets. So it's really material chemistry that enables this to happen as well. And so we also scaled down this big angiochip that needs about 2 million cells to basically 1D angiochip, which we called angiotube, to create this platform which we called INVADE, Integrated Vasculature for Assessing Dynamic Events. And if you put one of these um, polymeric blood vessels in a column of a 96-well plate, and we create the bottom of this plate by ourselves using hot embossing and craft facility, you can basically have multiple mini organs connected through the column of a 96-well plate, and we've used this in a number of publications to create heart, liver, tumor, 
even to mimic SARS-CoV-2 induced inflammation and myocarditis, endotheliolitis, basically, as well as to test uh, pollution uh, toxicity. But one thing that we haven't overcome, and I, I want to use my remaining few minutes to talk about that, is connecting this macro and microvasculature. So the Invade platform and your chip, the smallest uh, polymeric vessels that we were able to create are about 50 microns in uh, diameter. And that's pretty big, right? It's not like a capillary. It's sort of on the venule size. So could we create something like what you can see in this slide, where the macrovasculature is connected to really microvasculature, something like capillaries? And that's possible. Obviously, there's a picture there. Um, if we just mix up, uh, let's say, endothelial cells and stromal cells, but when we start adding other cell types, such as cardiomyocytes, this is no longer possible. And uh, I want to talk about that for the next couple of minutes. So first of all, it's well known that if you want to stabilize uh, microvessels in vitro, you need to add some kind of stromal cell type. And what you can see in the first row, the appearance of these structures that are created from uh, HUVEC that are GFP positive, and um, and uh, um, uh, uh, dermal pulp stem cells. If we don't put dermal pulp stem cells, we don't get stable vasculature. And you get this kind of picture after about two weeks, right? When we add the stromal cells, we get really nice stable vasculature, and people have known that before. So we thought, well, let's do the same thing for vascularization, microvascularization of myocardium. Let's take these uh, stromal cells, mix them in, and we are gonna get beautiful vasculature. That actually doesn't happen at all once you add cardiomyocytes, which you can see in the top row in this tree culture that um, uh, settings. It, without cardiomyocytes, we can get the vasculature. With cardiomyocytes, it's not possible. By day 10, everything is gone. And then you can tell us, well, just figure out the ratio. You don't have the right cell ratio. And so we've done that as well, very systematically vary the ratio of cardiomyocytes that we are putting into these three cultures. They're going from zero to 70%. And you can clearly see that uh, the presence of blood vessels is mutually exclusive, at least in this in vitro settings, with the presence of cardiomyocytes and beading, right? The more endothelial cells you put in, uh, the, the less beading you have. And if you put more cardiomyocytes, then you don't have endothelial cells. So we are missing something. We can't establish a functional circuit. And obviously we know in the body it's possible. Our hearts are vascularized. So we're clearly missing something. And uh, another, another important thing that we notice is that in these settings, when you just mix isolated endothelial cells with, a, a, let's say, a stromal cell type and cardiomyocytes, suddenly this is a very inflammatory environment that we measure a lot of inflammatory markers like IL-6 and uh, uh, various endothelial activation markers. So the cells are just not in the right phenotype. And so we thought, how could we do this? Uh, and uh, what is it that we, mi uh, we are missing? So we hypothesized that we might be missing these resident macrophages uh, that are really important in the body for maintaining tissue homeostasis. And so this is a collaborative work with uh, Slava Appelman and Gordon Keller. And now in the context of four, uh, four cell co-culture where we take endothelial cells, stromal cells, cardiomyocytes, and these primitive macrophages that are derived from human embryonic stem cells, we can very well establish very stable vasculature in engineered myocardium. If you look at the top row of these uh, histologies, you see three culture with cardiomyocytes without macrophages. We don't have a lot of blood vessels there. When we add macrophages, the blood vessels are maintained, and so are the cardiomyocytes. You can see striations in uh, the uh, far right column. Importantly, um, and maybe it's counterintuitive. Obviously, macrophages cannot beat, right? That's pretty obvious. So we, like, you, you may think, well, if you add more non-myocytes, you're going to compromise that contractile function of uh, the engineered muscle. And in this uh, assay, we just use our BioWire 2 platform as an assay for contractility. We can see that when we add macrophages, we actually enhance uh, electrical excitability and contractile properties of these tissues. We are getting higher maximum capture rate 
even over a longer period of time, over two weeks, the passive tension is going down, which is really important, and the active force is going up. We need to add, this is ongoing unpublished work, so we need to add a few more replicates to uh, get significant differences in every category. But the trends are really, really uh, clear that this ratio of active force to passive tension significantly increases when you add uh, macrophages, despite having more non-myocytes there. And importantly, uh, only in the presence of macrophages we are able to really create perfusible vessels. So we use one of these well-played systems to uh, track perfusion, and you can look at the system without macrophages in the top row. The, basically, the dye, uh, the red dye, cannot get in. The blue uh, polystyrene beads, they can get into the micro microvasculature, because it's really not perfusible. These are just strings of ropes of cells. But when you add macrophages, you can see dextran is coming into the tissue, the red uh, dye in the first column. And if could, somebody could click right into that middle video, the, the, uh, go back please, go back. If you could click right in the middle, there is a middle panel, yeah. You can see the polystyrene bead perfusion with the presence of macrophages. And we actually get higher blood vessel density and we can measure permeability because we get perfusion. Without macrophages, we can't even measure permeability because nothing is getting in. It's just a slab of gel with cells. And so let's go to the next slide. And so uh, uh, you can see in this image the uh, Macrophages are actually RFP positive, and the endothelial cells are shown in uh, green, and you can see contraction of this va uh, vascularized cardiac muscle that has uh, microvasculature in it. So um, let's go to the next slide. So in summary, um, I showed you how by controlling structure, let's say topographical cues, or micro shape of the scaffold, we can uh, uh, have perfusible um, vasculature through which you can pass circulating immune cells. Uh, we have these platforms that don't require pumps or bulky boxes, they're pretty easy to run, and that enable us to create stable microvasculature with tunable permeability. And then finally, uh, at the end, I also showed you that um, only with uh, primitive macrophages, we are really able to create stable vasculature over longer periods of time. Now we're talking about two to three weeks. Uh, and some, in some of our studies, even longer, up to four weeks. Uh, right now we're investigating the mechanism. Obviously, um, inflammatory molecules are something that we are looking at, as well as exosome cargo that is secreted by, by macrophages in these settings. Uh, and so, uh, in the acknowledgments, I'd like to thank the collaborators, the students, and our funding sources, and I guess we'll take the questions during the discussion. Thank you very much.